Hi, this is Norm Jones. I'm a professor emeritus of history at Utah State University, and I'm here to talk to you about staying home and staying healthy during the plague in Florence in 1630-31. In this time of COVID-19, when most of us are under orders to stay at home and large gatherings are forbidden, it's good to understand the historical roots of this approach to controlling infectious disease. It began in Florence in the plague of 1630-31. In the fall of 1630, the Florentines knew that the plague was approaching, carried by the invading mercenary armies of the Holy Roman Empire. News came from Milan and other cities to the north of the outbreak of the Orsinia Pestis, the Black Death, and the cities were enacting traditional plague controls. Their public health authorities, the Sanita, used quarantine to protect the healthy from the diseased. Strangers were not allowed into the city. When a victim was reported and confirmed, the house in which the sick person was living was sparred up so no one could come in or out. In most places, a large cross was painted on the door to clearly mark the quarantine, and the people inside stayed there for 40 days. Pits were prepared for mass burials, and the Sanita hired extra help to clean the streets. Because they believed plague was caused by bad air, malaria, they lit fires of resinous wood in the streets to purify the air, and people wore masks that contained scented herbs as a preventative. These were precautions that were common across all of Europe, since Europeans shared a common medical understanding of the disease. But in Florence in 1630-31, they tried something different. Rather than quarantine individual houses, the Florentine Sanita and their energetic young Duke Ferdinand opted to stop the movement of the entire population. Everyone who was not engaged in essential work was ordered to stay home and not go out. The order was absolute for women and children, while men might be permitted passes to do necessary work. So about half the population had to remain in their houses, under threat of public flogging, fines, imprisonment, and even execution. Food, drink, and firewood were delivered daily by the Sanitas employees, who calculated that they had to supply about 33,000 rations each week, delivered by 1,100 workers. All of this was under the direction of the Spedale de Mendicanti, the beggar's hospital, which was charged with looking after the poor. The hospital's efforts were coordinated by the gentlemen who governed the local districts. They helped identify and support people who had no other sources of food. As was normal in Europe, they produced weekly reports on the number hospitalized and the number dead, tracking the spread of the disease. The decision for social distancing came after an intense debate. The anti-quarantine faction of the city council denied, in the beginning, that it was plague at all. And then they claimed that if it was plague, sanitation to improve the air was the answer. Florence, they said, simply could not withstand the economic cost of locking down the city. They also asserted that if the city started to feed the poor to keep them in their houses, the poor would, because they were being fed, refuse to work for wages, and welfare would destroy their work ethic. The need to eat, they said, kept people working. As soon as they did not need to work to eat, they would stop working and they would live in laziness. The pro-quarantine faction, on the other hand, said the social distancing was the best remedy. One expert wrote, public gatherings must be stopped, quote, because experience has shown that the contagion is spread by people mixing together. People in quarantine, he said, should be encouraged to breathe clean air by going onto their rooftops and opening their windows, but not going into the streets. The pro-quarantine faction won the debate, and on January the 30th, 1631, the Feast of San Sebastian, the patron of plague victims, free movement of the population was halted. In preparation, those with country houses had been allowed to leave and self-quarantine there. But for the poor and middle class remaining in the city, the lockdown was radical. All public events were halted. Church services were stopped, though priests might bring last rites to the dying if they were willing to take the risk. Masses and rosaries were set on street corners where the quarantine could watch, kneeling or, and praying from their doors and windows, and singing responses and hymns. It was reported that it was truly moving to hear the whole city singing prayers together. Priests heard confessions standing in doorways, and the archbishop declared that praying a series of prayers known as Un Corona del Signore, rehearsing Christ's sufferings, was equivalent to attending Mass. The archbishop cooperated in closing the churches, but there was a battle over control of the city's economic spaces. Whether the markets 
could be kept open and trade allowed, or they would be closed and people kept out of the public piazzas was a hot question. In some neighborhoods, the civic leaders demanded that they be kept open, while the medical experts demanded that they be closed. A few remained open, but most commerce stopped. With all the women and children quarantined, men over the age of 14 could get a pass to walk in the streets, though they were not allowed to enter houses. Since most shops opened onto the streets, curbside shopping was possible, and food preparers and vendors, who were classified as essential workers, could supply these men with what was to be had. Naturally, taverns and other places that sold food and drink were closed to prevent social mingling. Public funerals were halted, and those who died of the plague were buried outside the city in specially prepared plague pits. Though probably buried according to Christian practice, no mourners were allowed to follow the bodies to the grave. Those dying of normal sickness were permitted to be buried in their parish graveyards, but they too could not have public mourning. Many who died were in the special plague hospitals, the Lazaretti, when the end came. It was the legal duty of every head of household to report to the sanita if anyone became ill. A doctor would be dispatched to examine the patient and determine whether it was plague or just some normal disease. If it was plague, the infected person was removed to the lazaretti and isolated there until they died or recovered. Naturally, people were reluctant to report that their loved ones were ill since the arrival of the stretcher carts of the Brothers of the Fraternity of the Misericordia, a volunteer organization that transported the sick and the dead as an act of Christian mercy, generally meant that the person they came for would die in the hospital. In fact, less than half of them did. Of course, the health care workers in the Lazaretti suffered terribly, not only from the disease, a high percentage of the doctors and priests working there got it, but from the fact that they had to be separated from their families, lest they take the disease home with them. Of course, some of these care workers were ministering angels, but some were also taking advantage of the situation to rob the sick and the dead. They, like the apothecaries who sold fake medicines and overcharged, were sometimes arrested and tried, but most often they simply profited from the opportunities created by the disease and the panic. Then there are those who had been exposed to the plague, but who were not showing any symptoms. These, known as the sospetti, or suspected ones, were quarantined in, in special parts of the hospitals until they were determined to have the plague. If they did not, they were released. Those who had it and survived were transferred to convalescent centers, although the conditions there were not good for their health. Five and six to the bed can't have been. Thanks to the work of John Henderson, we know in detail about what happened in Florence during the plague. Henderson has studied the extensive records of the court of the Sanita that tried those who broke the quarantine rules. Teenagers who danced with neighbors. People who had fake passes. People who crept out of confinement at night. A mother who illegally received clothes to men for her son a grave digger who was selling the clothing of the dead, and many others were arrested. Under a system of special friends, who were informers, who got paid to turn in their neighbors, the Sanita kept a tight grip on the city. Only one quarantine breaker was executed, but many were punished with a strapado, a torture in which the arms were tied behind the back, the prisoner was hoisted up, and then dropped, disjoining the arms and shoulders. Most offenders, however, spent a short time in the Sanitas prison and were released. But Florence was officially pleased with this decisive war on the plague. The Florentines insisted that their measures had bent the curve. The city's mortality rate was lower than most cities around it. The death rates are hard to determine, but perhaps 30% of the Florentine population of 76,000, or 9,000 roughly, people died. By comparison, in Milan, 46% of its population of 130,000 people died. When the plague recurred in 1632 and 3, the Florentines repeated the experiment of social distancing even more rigorously. But as the anti-quarantine lobby had foreseen, this enforced shelter-in-place devastated the Florentine economy. Florence's major industry was cloth-making. They exported cloth all over the world. But shutting the city stopped much of the export er, and production, and it prevented traders from buying what was available. The lack of work had a terrible effect on the residents, even after the quarantine was lifted in June. In some ways, the city never fully recovered. Because the city government had to pay for the expense of feeding the poor, running the hospitals, burying the dead, its finances were wrecked, even as tax revenue collapsed from the lack of trade. Guido Alfano, 
has shown that this outbreak of the plague caused the economic decline of Italy in the 17th century. We are all feeling the social pain inflicted by COVID-19 and suffering with economic consequences. Just like the people of Florence in 1631, we have been asked to bear economic loss in the interest of saving the lives of our fellow citizens. The Florentine model applies now as it did then. Stay home, stay safe. The lives saved are worth the cost.